You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Welcome to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My Unusually Well-Informed guest today is Dr. Behnaz Galami. Behnaz is the founder of Deason, a research design and innovation consulting firm. She is a change strategist, a social scientist, and a researcher. Today, Bethnaz and I are discussing human experience, agile software development, change management, and more. Bethnaz, welcome to the show. Hi, team. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So, Bethnaz, you are the executive director of Deason, a research design and innovation consultancy. In the description of Deason, you say the nature of my work repeatedly drew attention to the nature of human beings in the workplace. It drew attention to our humanity. So my question is, how are the companies, how are companies neglecting what you call the extraordinary power of humanization? Yeah, so uh, this is actually a long story because um, uh, let me tell you a story about myself first. I was a software developer and uh, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we were dealing with like installing uh, or rolling out the ERP systems at the time, like back in 2004, 2006. And then I realized that, well, it's not actually about the technology. Like it's about people who are adopting technology. Like I was dealing with people complaining with uh, uh, <laughs> complaining and having resistance and all these things. And then I realized that, okay, so uh, it's just, you know, the matter of like how make people comfortable using the ERP system. So from the time I actually wanted to know more about the people more, right? So um, that's why like I focus on like organizational behavior or HR or uh, organizational psychology, applied psychology and all these things. However, I felt like, you know, there's so many things like if you search and I did the research actually because I, 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 I'm, I'm a researcher at the time, like when I researched, I felt like there are so many articles like on HBR or like scientific uh, outlets about like how to use the power of uh, human beings, like in terms of empowerment, in terms of uh, engagement, in terms of anything like that. And um, also if you, uh, I search like um, our articles on uh, big four com consulting companies like McKinsey's and Deloitte and every like single article was about like, okay, the, uh, the power of people or humanization. But what I found like I can, uh, during my experience, like 15 years of experience, like uh, I felt like they are all like <laughs> only on papers, right? So when you go to a, a project or you work for a company or you work for a client as a company, like the people side is actually really neglected, right? Or it's just belong to HR and H HR is uh, not just, uh, somehow doomed or like uh, isolated or something like that and I felt like really sad about that because uh, the more I read about the necessity of rehumanization of organization the more I get disappointed in the real life right in terms of <laughs> um, that's why like I felt like okay so uh, Let's practice it, actually. Let's uh, one, do one step at a time, like change management, one step at a time. The, need, the field needs to change. So, like, here I am. And I felt like uh, the pandemic, silver lining of pandemic is actually focusing more on humanization of workplaces. So that's a good thing about focus, the focus more. Absolutely. And, and it is a very challenging time, but it's also a time when people are, are discovering, you know, what, what is missing and what do we have to recreate when we're, when we're scattered the way we are. You know, many people are working from home and they need to connect online. You have described the pandemic as, as the current unexpected disruption that caused leaders to think twice about responding to turmoil and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Where do you see le leaders responding best to this disruption? 
You know, uh, these are the topics uh, that are now hot topics. And actually, these are actually um, reasonable to be hot topics. And one topic is actually everybody knows, like working from home and then the hybrid concept of work, right? And I, I believe that this is like how to form an organization, a community or like the culture when we are working from home. So this is structural design of uh, uh, organization or uh, design and uh, not organizational design in terms of power or like um, uh, what we used to do, what we do in organizational design and development, but a structural design of organization in terms of developing culture is now a very fertile component of humanization right now. Because then let's say that in culture, uh, we have like uh, structures of how and formation of people across the company. Like for example, it's hierarchy, it's a star or it's something like that. And then we have the knots. Knots are in this network are people actually. And then <clears throat> we have the, a relation between these nodes, like people, like the relation, the relational aspects between these nodes in the network of the company, which form culture to me. And then these are these three perspectives in terms of uh, structure, people inside the cognitive side of people and relations between people are three aspects of the culture that we can focus uh, in terms of uh, humanization and actually leaders are paying attention to it fortunately. So can I explore that a little further then? So mm -hmm. um, you, you described three levels and I just wanna make sure I understand them. So there's, there's the, the node, the individual person. Yes. And then there's, I guess, the team they work on and then the larger organization. And it sounds like you're, did I get that right or did I miss a detail there? Yeah, so let me uh, elaborate on that. So the concept of uh, social capital, I, I adopted from uh, Nafiet and Goshal uh, research. So they, they actually define uh, social capital at, as three dimensions. So a structural, cognitive and relational, right? So a structural is the, it's the structure, the formation of people, right? As I mentioned here, is, uh, is either hierarchy or a star, or like, let's say that there is like from top down or uh, bottom up, all these things like the structure, the skeleton of how people form, right? In teams and in one organization. The second one is people, like the cognitive side of this uh, structure which are people and it's if you consider it as a network or dots there are knots and there are dots in this network and then the relations so the lines between two dots like two people are relational so this is three aspects of social capital and to me considering this as a culture of organization like three culture or one and uh, three dimension of a uh, one culture it actually can help us humanize more organization more. I see. Thank you. And I guess one of the things that happens when people are working, not necessarily from home, I mean, we've always had instances and you, you've, you've studied this when you have international teams who don't necessarily sit together. Yeah. That, that sometimes depending on how the meetings are constructed or, or even who contacts who, it, you might be addressing, you might be working through the structural side, but not necessarily through the cognitive or cultural side. Like you might be mismapping how you connect with one another. Is that one of the challenges? Yeah. So one of the challenges is, is exactly like, you know, uh, actually the, the structural part is actually missing because we are all working from home or in the work, uh, in the virtual work teams, actually. So, uh, uh, but the relational part and cognitive is still there. So we should work on that, right? So um, uh, even like in terms of 
structure is not like the physical uh, connection between people. It's like um, uh, people, yeah, how they, do they connect maybe via a software or something? It might be one, one aspect of the structural dimension, but uh, still we can have their relational, like how people relate, to, like are connected to each other. And then uh, like, what are the values that connect people in terms of like cognitive values and mission and vision will still be our concentration for culture. So earlier on today, you, you spoke about your, the sort of shift you took from studying technology to studying how mm -hmm. technology impacts people. And then finally, really just how people affect people, if I may sort yeah. of generalize. <laughs> and um, so your education took you around the world, culminating in a PhD in business administration, management and operations. Can you describe that journey? Can you like, how did you find yourself going from one spot to the other? And how did you change your major? How was that? Yeah, so um, to continue my my story, like I realized that, you know, I want to, uh, when I, I, I was coding the software and all these things, I thought, I felt like, okay, I want to, you know, uh, see people that I am coding for, right? I want to see how they interact with the software, how they work with the software, what are their pain points. I really wanted to just, you know, uh, see people and talk to people because I, I, I am a people person. So like, and a nerdy developer, I was not <laughs> like that. <laughs> so that was, that's why. So uh, basically, I am. I was born in Iran, in Middle East, and then I did my MBA in Malaysia, the Far East. And I realized that uh, because in MBA, I uh, I came uh, across this concept of organizational behavior, HR, and more of a people side, like marketing, consumer behavior, and all these things, like uh, behavioral economics. So I felt like I need to know more about people. So how people like the psychology of people or like how people are, are in one setting as an organization. So I want to know more. So I did my PhD in Germany and uh, my PhD was uh, for on, uh, actually I was both consultant and researcher. So both working and as a researcher in academia. So I was working on agile transformation and uh, that's where I really realized that um, it's uh, also about like people because it's like a technical agile and it's a mindset agile mindset. So that's why I focus on concept of leadership, learning and team composition. So uh, my PhD was in the setting of IT industry still. Uh, however, my uh, my focus was more on, a, on applied psychology and like the terms of like how people learn and how self-organizing team are formed and all these things. Yeah, so it was a fascinating journey. And now I'm in Canada. <laughs> Actually, it's like seven years I'm in Canada. <laughs> well, I, I'm also in Canada, so I'm glad you're yeah. here. Um, so one of the things that you correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like one of your specialties is human experience or HX. Yeah. So yeah. Can, can we start with that? And uh, can you outline what HX is and how it compares to things like customer experience or, or other, other forms of experience? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we have uh, this concept of like user experience so customer experience a lot like experience is like something that uh, you know uh, brings some kind of feeling for you you have some kind of impression and then it will uh, remain in your mind like referring to joe pine the author of experience economy like it should be experiences can be memorable or meaningful or um, uh, even transformative, right? So these are these levels of experiences. Like one experience is just maybe at the lower level, like a repetitive experience, like something that we do like just mechanically. The other one is, as, as I said, like a memorable that just we remember as we go, like the experience was something that we remember. The other one is like uh, the uh, meaningful 
also com uh, encompass the two others. So it's it might be something that we do. It's memorable, but uh, it's meaningful. So we just have this meaning of uh, something cognitively, like reflecting on the experience. And then finally, transformative is like it's obviously transforming us. It's changing us. It's one way or another, right? So these are these levels of experiences. So this is the like uh, a definition of experience. Now we have this concept of like user experience, customer experience, employee experience. And um, to me, why I chose human uh, experience because it's holistic. For example, when uh, we talk about user experience, we're talking about the experience of the user with a software or a system or something like that. So it's the interaction between the two and the experiences the user of this system is having, right? When we are talking about customer experience, it's more of a marketing side, like the customer is experienced with the interaction again with our brand or like a product or something. So it's still our customer and the brand. So it's still limited to the two, right? And employee experience is also employee uh, along in the organization from like a onboarding to just working to just leaving. All these things will be the touch point of experience in the company. So employee and company. However, human experience encompass all these like um, because uh, human experience means that the experience of you as a human with the whole ecosystem, right? And then the ecosystem is can be the nature, can be organization, but all the experiences that it have, all the like uh, memories that it brings, all the meaningfulness that it brings, all the values and norms that it, that it brings. So uh, for example, uh, people, for example, want to work in a, in a industry which is taking care of like a climate change, right? So maybe the employee experience is not so much about cl climate change, but the human experience is like a human who, who happens to be an employee who cares about climate change, who cares that the company who this person is working cares about human experience. So these are all like the, uh, the holistic view. And I feel like we should just, you know, zoom out and see the whole environment of change and transformation through human experience, not, not other excess. <laughs> So, okay, so the, I, I'm, I think I'm beginning to understand it better. So human experience encompasses all the other experiences because we're only one human each. And so yeah. we're affected by, for example, we might be affected by the company we work at and there might be some user experiences. There might even be some customer experiences like they yes. need to sell us the pension plan or whatever. But the whole experience is 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 the HX. It's the HX. Like this is me. Like I choose it to be a human because then human is like everything human, right? It's not only being a user or customer or an employee. It's just being human with all the holistic view of the human. <laughs> and so, who in an organization? Like because there are many humans in every organization works with, there could be customers, it could be employees, it could be other stakeholders. Who, who is responsible for HX? Because I would think that it, it, it has to encompass many people in the company to be that holistic, right? Yeah, that's a good question. And I tell you this, sorry, once I posted uh, an HBR uh, article on, uh, on LinkedIn, and it was like, uh, who owns culture or something like, HR is not the mere owner of the company, something like that. And right. there were many, many discussion under these articles about like who owns culture uh, because, uh, and then there, there is also discussions about who owns employee experience, right? Inside a company and who owns customer experience. And um, actually experts believe that uh, there should be a chief experience officer in each 
company who has this holistic view of human experience, but who can work also on customer experience and employee experience. And I tell you, and uh, there is a gap between human ex um, employee e experience and customer experience in companies like who uh, the, the people who are not working on marketing or sale or a specific customer experience uh, um, uh, they are really like far from customer experience, like how our customer is experiencing our product or services. So e EX is so internal and uh, CX is obviously external. And there are discussions that um, we should have uh, some kind of like CXO who owns both so who can see the gap between them and then fill the gap. Because obviously uh, enhancing the employee experience to me can enhance the customer experience, but how and in what point and what touch point it's important to know. So a specifying a department that can so, will be supported by HR, by operation, and obviously by leadership at the top, uh, it's so important to, to consider that. But usually organizations uh, who are like very exper in experienced industry, like let's say, uh, uh, let's say restaurants, right? Or like hospitality. So they have, uh, normally they have the CX department, but EX then will be belong to HR, right? So if you ask me as an, uh, let's say expert or somebody who fills the gap, I feel like there should be someone who sits between the two and owns it, then everybody can be accountable. But to me, for example, the, the someone should be has, should have the authority to, you know, take care of this piece together. So that's really interesting because it, it seems to me that a bad HX would be sort of a, a lagging indicator. So you might you might be able to sell tickets on your airline, right? You might be able to make enough business because your marketing is good and your prices are good. But if, you're, if your HX is low, in the future, you're going to have less customers. And the same thing applies to the, the employee experience. So it, it, it's almost like the long-term view on how you're affecting people and having yeah, it in one spot is, is an interesting idea. It's interesting example you made, team. For example, let's see about like uh, the uh, the uh, the airline industry, right? So they want to enhance the customer experience, like the passenger experience, right? And then they might be able to uh, enhance the passenger experience, uh, the customer experience, but without moving from CX to HX. Actually, in the long run, they might lose because people are now more sensitive about like environment, about like everything around sustainability, how flights works and then, you know, fossil fuels and all these things, right? So if we only consider the customer experience in terms of, uh, you may enhance your passenger experience in the short run, but you cannot make a royal passenger or something like that because you don't care about the whole big picture, which is HX, for example. And it's the same in terms of EX, for example, you are working in an airline that doesn't care about like sustainability, right? So then um, this piece, I actually made sustainability as an example because it's so obvious. And then if you go, you want to deep dive in terms of the, the holistic, holistic view of the uh, employee HX, there they might be many things in terms of value and norms, but, uh, sustainability is a big piece. And then back to the example, when you work on an airline that doesn't care about sustainability or climate change, you might be able to have a great experience as an employee merely uh, in the abstract level in organization, but in the long run, they, the people care about sustainability and climate change. So you need to have this holistic view of your industry and your company. And I have seen here, for example, in energy industry that people really care about like the, this, the uh, actually the future plan of like energy and all these things. Although in the environment, the company culture was so good, but they care. 
And if company miss to care about this holistic view, actually it happens to like lose their employees gradually. So the, the great thing about HX then is that it encompasses the other experience disciplines. And so there's quite a few tools you can bring to bear. And I'd like to go look at a couple of them, if you don't mind. One of them is um, uh, personas. So what is a persona and how does it affect how you design an experience? Okay, so persona, for example, in the traditional way, persona is uh, actually our, uh, depending on which X we are using, persona is a user or customer or a stakeholder or employee, right? And personas are, the definition is like they're representative of a group of a stakeholder that we are working on, right? Um, uh, however, uh, uh, slightly the concept of persona might change in different disciplines. Like to me, as a change of strategies, persona in change management, what I define it in change management is different from the concept of persona in product development, uh, who are like users, right? So, but basically we have this persona to see that, okay, so these are representative group of uh, stakeholders. And then we try to understand this persona, right? Persona means like, for example, Jane Smith, <laughs> like typically. So Jane is a representative of a group of a stakeholder, like employees, like let's say IT department, or like our users, like girls uh, 14 years or between like 18 or 14 years, something like that, like teenagers. So these are their personas. And then we try to deep down in terms of their needs, their demographic, their, their understanding of the world. And in HX, it's just, you know, it's above the traditional uh, definition of the persona because Traditionally, we go towards like demographic, like l what might this person like or like all the attitudes and all these things. But in terms of a persona in HX, we have these all the touch points that currently are important for one human being in this social and economical and political situation of the ecosystem, right? Not the interaction, as I say. So uh, persona actually is a powerful tool but in the brackets, it has some criticizes. Some people have really hates that because the, then they feel like persona would label people and put people in a box without uh, flexibility. Uh, to me, uh, this is a valid criticism. However, considering it, like moving it from one perspective, one X perspective to human perspective, HX might resolve the problem somehow. So you, you have more holistic view of a human being rather than user or customer or employee. And then this is the very first point to uh, empathize with our human in our ecosystem. So I've seen it used as a tool and I can understand what you're saying that there is some controversy or at least mm -hmm. some challenge with it because yeah. we might say, okay, well, uh, a male, you know, in his fifties, uh, you know, certain income or whatever, but, but you may be defining things that don't really affect their experience as much as how far they are from the airport or how many kids they have. You might, you might be categorizing people in a yeah. way that doesn't really help you. Yeah. Um, is there, is there a science to that? Or do you have to just keep trying? How do you, how, because everybody's unique, right? And it's a challenge yeah. to put people into a category. Yeah, actually it's unique. And it's actually, uh, let's say that, no, you cannot say that there is a very specific, you know, check the box <laughs> uh, to say that how we develop personas. I basically, try to just listen to people and ask good question about their experiences to during the day or during like, okay, so my expertise is transformation. So during a specific transformation or change in organizations, right? So I try not to ask a specific question. I try to put people in a storytelling mode. Like, let's say that tell me a day that blah, blah, or tell me a day that you felt frustrated or you felt happy or close your eyes and tell me about. So 
all the things like you have more than open-ended question you have people to tell their story and then uh, the talking to people uh, you need uh, to have a really good research team to do that so to have a good question uh, be listeners and then add better questions like you know to when people talk about it and then the storytellers to you know to put people also in the storytelling mode and you make them the hero or heroine of their uh, of their uh, story so they can tell you actually the actual situation so this way you can the more you talk with people from different the stakeholder group you have the idea that what might be important in the ecosystem that they are like in the organizations, right? And then since you don't ask a specific question and they are more open-ended question, they, they tap into something that is important. Uh, so then it's, it's actually a research uh, job, a researcher job to see that it's a category, it's a theme that comes up it's a pattern or it's just a very personal uh, thing right so and we see that in a pattern or in a theme we don't have a specific like uh, ev everything not necessarily should be like or uh, like look alike but they are more or less like generally look like to, um, they are they are on their same umbrella right so there then it's the matter of like data analysis and see that if the pattern is really valid or not. So then uh, if it is and uh, science like data analysis sh shows us, then we go from there. So necessarily sometimes the team should be, uh, can be breaking down to other like patterns and other, other posts that we just have this magnifier to talk and think about it or not, it's just a team that you should just consider it as from the general idea. So it depends on the research then. Okay, that, that's actually very helpful because I've been in a room where it's like, mm -hmm. okay, let's let's dream up some avatars, some some uh, um, what what do we what are we calling um, personas, personas for people, yeah. <laughs> and and we're doing it in a room where we aren't in, we haven't interviewed people yet and so that's a really helpful insight is that you can't figure out the categories even until you talk to people directly so that's really helpful yeah and that's a, one of the cri uh, criticism and controversies are around personas because there are some uh, you know uh, formats and templates of personas that many like designers try to follow but it shouldn't be like, you should be open <laughs> to what people say and you should first listen, then you can generate. <laughs> <laughs> so once you have a persona is, is one of the, you've, you've kind of touched on um, in, in general, like first principles, you want to gather information from people so you understand their circumstance, but there are instruments you use to try to organize that information so you can share it with others. Journey maps and empathy maps seem to flow from um, the uh, the persona exercise. Can you talk a little bit about those two maps and what they're meant to achieve? Yeah, so uh, basically these are, uh, we have this empathizing process in the first step of the human center approaches, right? And then basically, uh, Empathy map and journey map are two very basic and important tools from the like pools of the tools in the empathizing process. Uh, because basically from the empathy map, you will figure out that uh, how people, you have these multidimensional aspects of how people experience the situation. So because uh, you cannot only talk about like, what do you feel? you need to talk about what you see, what are your interactions, what did you hear? And uh, uh, what's, uh, so all this, all the five senses, right? And then uh, emotionally, or like in terms of even uh, the very tangible gains or pains, like what are your gains or pains? And then, uh, so basically you cover in the impact map, you cover multidimensional, aspects of one's experience to see that how they feel, how they see, how they hear, what are their pains, what are their gains. 
And the more you can, you know, put people in a situation that people can be themselves and be open to what actually they, they experience along the way, the more you can have more uh, genuine empathy map. So this is the first step to go one level deeper into the life of a persona. And then sometimes the beauty of the research at the very beginning is like you don't need or maybe need less to go uh, and do a second research in terms of empathizing process because you already have the data from the initial research, right? You can simply put it in your empathy map, right? And then uh, in terms of journey map, so journey mapping is a really an art, right? So, and it's a really um, important aspects of the design process because it tells you the process of experiences one by one, all the touch point that one have with the interacting with the service or a product or a change. So basically, right? So something that is changing their life, right? So these are the touch points that are the journeys that the persona goes through till they get the final result. So basically, there are two types of journey map. This is uh, like ideally we have current state journey map and future state journey map. So current state journey map is still the uh, phase of empathizing with people. So you can, you can, if you talk to people regarding their experiences along the journey, you can actually bring it again from the research and put it in a journey map, like a step one, a step two, a step three, they see, they feel, they pain points. So it actually beautifully, drag, we can, you can drag it and extract it from uh, empathy map, right? And then the future state journey map is like the ideal situation for them. So if, again, if you ask about their ideal situation from the beginning, you can, you can beautifully fill the future state journey map uh, for them from the initial research. And obviously it's the matter of iteration. You should always ask and validate if you, what you generated is, is valid to them. Tim, you're muted. Thank you. That's great. So I, I can sort of imagine, I, I have noises in the house. Uh, the challenge of a teenage boy, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I think is so terrific about these maps is, as you say, you can, you can put the information in that you've collected in your research, but it can also really highlight, you know, oh, we didn't even know this was a pain point or... Yeah. Or, oh, there's so many more steps to this than we imagined. We thought they just had to buy a ticket and show up, but they actually have to arrange an Uber and they have to park or whatever. You know, there's, you know, dragging your bags through the airport. There's all these different steps that you might not even contemplate. And so you can really pinpoint things. So that's terrific. One, exactly. one, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Because, the, because we want to, you know, not a Speculate. Actually, the whole point of experience design and then uh, for my job, like uh, just, you know, put integrated into the change management and transformation, designing the change plan and the strategy is like uh, we usually take for granted what people experience along the way, right? And then uh, we usually feel like, okay, so it's a straight or like, Maybe if we are so kind to them, <laughs> it's like, okay, so it's maybe A, B, C, like four or five steps. But then you, when you go down, you might see that they're more complicated and complex. That's why like we just, you know, try to avoid any kind of resistance, for, uh, not in avoid, but, you know, uh, take care, let's say, take care of resistances right from the beginning, from the touch points that, we didn't know they happened. One of the one of the other um, techniques that, that looks at human experience or the various kinds of experience, it, it's a the jobs to be done framework, which I find yeah. really interesting. Can you expand on how that works and why it helps create insight? Yeah, jobs to be done. Actually, these are you know uh, these are actually the points when you have this journey map. Actually, maybe it's also 
important to have these two together because jobs to be done, as it says, uh, it's the jobs to be done. So it's like the, uh, the steps that you have to just perform a task in terms of interacting with the, again, system or ecosystem or something like that. Or uh, the jobs to be done also have this concept that I think that uh, less people pay attention, but I tell you the, to, I tell this to your audience and it's a very delicate aspect. So we have two concepts, jobs to be done and moments that matter or moments of truth. So let's take a look on the two and see that what's the difference, right? So job to be done are the jobs, like a step, a step to be performed to get the outcomes. A persona goes through the journey to do something, to do like get satisfied, so to get the result. These are job to be done. And then moments that matter, definition are the, the moments that the touch points that create experiences that we should focus on that we shouldn't ignore because these moments can actually change the whole experience of a user or customer or employee or the human itself. However, if you want to just uh, see the difference between the two jobs to be done consists of many moments that matter. So, if you want to go like moments that matter is one level deeper into jobs to be done. So each job, like let's say task one for persona A, like for Jane Smith, task one, or like let's say buying the ticket have many moments to it. Like let's say buying the ticket, like load the web page, right? And then uh, see the buying ticket or like see the just you know searching for ticket or like the hit the purchase button these are the moments that matter that can you know uh, even create the great experience or worst experience on, of a user right so these are the things that we, uh, we consider in also empathizing with uh, stakeholders and designing experiences so let me return to your IT roots for a little bit. Um, in 2003, Nicholas Carr wrote an article titled, IT Doesn't Matter. Yeah. What is your reaction to that idea? <laughs> That's a great question. And I'm laughing because I remember the, um, uh, the reaction. So um, actually, this was one of our cases studies from Harvard Business Review in our business school in MBA. And then when the instructor just uh, told us to read this and I was like, oh, <laughs> I am trying to get my MBA in IT management. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, and I was like, no, <laughs> like what is going on? So if it doesn't matter. What... So at the young age, I was like, yeah, I had hope that IT matters so much. So then I, I have a degree in IT management and I had so much hope to be like, yeah, to get the job or something like that. And then the topic was like, yeah, for some few uh, minutes, I was like, okay, so What's going on in here? Uh, uh, but yeah, actually, uh, Nicholas here at that moment, uh, that's a, actually case uh, article actually discussed that IT once become the infrastructure of any industry that you cannot see, say that it, it will be the core competency anymore, but it's just the infrastructure in any company. And um, uh, actually, it didn't threaten my threaten my job because then if it's an infrastructure, then your job is an essential work. <laughs> so uh, my my worries were, were not valid. But yeah, this was his point. <laughs> well, I think that that um, it makes me think of when people complain about Uber. They never complain about. I very rarely complain about the car. Right, the car is infrastructure. It's the driver. It's the experience of getting the ride. It's where they drop you off. Whether you feel safe getting in or out, the car is a non-issue. And yet, we are in the transportation business, right? 
Yeah, exactly. So that's why like we are also in the experience economy, like, you know, we drive monetary aspects, money out of creating experiences, right? And then there is a famous, uh, I think that uh, what you mentioned at Uber, like Uber is a transportation, but it doesn't have cars, right? Or like Facebook is a newsroom without like being a newsroom or Amazon or all these things, right? So Airbnb, it doesn't have like hotels, but these are the, the like the brands that create experiences for you. That's why like I strongly believe that we are still in the experience economy. And to again, uh, referencing Joel, uh, to Joe's point, now after pandemic, we're more into the concept of transformative experiences that transform people, transform their perspective, transform uh, actually their views to life. So staying in the IT theme again, uh -huh. um, in uh, I'm, I'm sorry to take you into the Wayback Machine, but in 2011, you co-authored a paper on global IT project management. And I yeah. think it's really interesting for a few reasons. One is we live in a world where maybe we're not global, but we're all separated. So the same techniques apply except for time zone troubles. Um, but you were, you were really studying how people could do distributed or global IT management with what was then called web 2.0. I don't know what we're up to now. Is it three? Is it four? <laughs> but it's all, it's, it's yeah. the, it's the, the, the most recent tools, right? And here we are, we're talking in zoom and I'm sure you've had many, many, many zoom calls in the last yeah. year and a half. Um, are, are there lessons in that paper that you, you think, Oh, it makes sense. Now I can see it happening during COVID. You know, something from that paper, actually, this was uh, actually the research happened in 2009, I think. And yeah, I was working, I worked on Web.2 on, and it was like, yeah, first about like, it was, I think, social media, which was like more dominant by Facebook. And then I was, I worked on like Meshop or RRS feed or Wikipedia, like wikis, wiki pages and all. So uh, uh, one thing that I still believe that it's valid, it's uh, uh, the customization of uh, each means of connection, let's say that is so important. Like it's a still, we can see here and uh, my research shows, for example, for example, Facebook is more towards like connecting with family and friends. And at the time, like Wiki was source of information, like uh, for uh, what Wikipedia is doing, like encyclopedia or something like that. So actually all these like web two tools are used for one aspect of the connection, human connection. And uh, uh, it was at the, at the time was obvious, but then it showed that people try to be creative and use one, one uh, like aspect, one social media for like team building or like creative works and all these things. But still, then we say that this, the business model of one social media is about this topic. It remains this topic. So, for example, uh, uh, LinkedIn, like the nature of LinkedIn is totally different from Facebook. And whoever tries to treat LinkedIn as Facebook face like, you know, <laughs> a backlash about that. Or um, so I feel like these are the things that social media has its own limitation and then the business model behind each social media can guide us towards one activity or two very customized and this shows the lesson that we need to um, you know benefit from different social media social uh, perspective of these um, applications and uh, come across one holistic view that works for our team or like for whatever reason we are using it. But uh, yeah, so 
maybe a common sense, but research should prove everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so speaking of, of your research, you also looked into agile self-organizing teams. Yes. So start for the top, from the top for me, what is agile software development? How, is it different from, is there a regular software development? How does agile work? Yeah, so for those of your audience that want to know more about Agile, uh, basically we had the Agile versus Waterfall. And Waterfall used to be like, um, you know, you have your customer needs, customer told you what they want, and then you go through and uh, um, you begin your work, just build it. And then after, for example, one year, two year, or like maybe six months or something you tell your customer that okay this is what you wanted and uh, so um, yeah just take it and use it something like that so it's a step by step waterfall like it's uh, step one step two is step three uh, i don't go into details now and uh, it happened to fail a lot because uh, actually uh, like in software development uh, developers used to develop without double check the customer needs, right? And then you talk to people, people tell you something, but after six months, maybe their requirement changed <laughs> or they forgot what they required, right? And then, or maybe it's just a speculation. They told you something, but they wanted something else or your impression was different. So this happened in Waterfall a lot. And then Agile said that uh, the concept of Agile com came from the Toyota aspects, Toyota manufacturing. And uh, uh, it was basically the philosophy is like you develop a small pieces of prototype, what call it uh, MVPs, minimum viable product. So uh, something that is still works that the customers should still work with but with less amount of money and time, it will be like very effective. They showed it to the customer. If they work with it and they approve it, they go for other piece, right? So you build on the other piece. Every piece should be uh, should work and should be test uh, should be um, you know available for testing. So should be testable, let's say. But uh, every time across the way you double check with your actual customers and you, you come to the same page and you develop more. So basically this one, you save money and time because then you always check, you go back and forth and this will be agile. So agile basically is based on iteration and feedback loop across the uh, producers or, or not the creators or makers of, of something, either like the, a manufacturing industry or IT industry uh, and the customers of this industry. Uh, and it has many models in it, like the basically in IT we have, we had so many models like V models, XP, uh, we had a Scrum, all these things. These are technical in software development, but the agile that I can see is like practice so far is more based on the Scrum. And what the Scrum is, the Scrum is based on, again, like the small pieces of soft a task that you tell to developers to develop. And then uh, they develop it during like seven to 10 uh, cycle. And they check it uh, with the actual uh, product owner, which is someone who is connected to the customers. And then if they you get it right, you just go towards another pieces. If not, you need to change it. So then it will be quick and it will be a much like a transparency also. It contributes to team building because agile teams are not just sitting uh, in front of their computer without communicating with each, with each other. Everybody should tell that what they are doing, what are their problem, who needs help or something like that. So much of a transparency and trust in organization. So an agile have two aspects, the agile mindset, which call a, a small A, mm -hmm. and a big A is a technical agile. So technical agile is what all uh, do we uh, do in the software industry in terms of action, what is the structure of doing agile. 
but being agile is like the mindset because uh, obviously like uh, agile teams are supposed to be self-organizing uh, empowered they they are transparent in their tasks and uh, what are they doing they need to connect to the stakeholder and customers on the cycle basis and all these things are uh, really hard they're like a changing behavior every aspect of it is one changing behavior so so many behavioral change is associated with a small a agile like agile mindset and you know yeah this is agile <laughs> yeah thank you that that does make it a lot clearer and there are a few things that people expect agile teams to be one is to be self-organizing yeah why is that an important aspect of an agile team why why don't they have somebody sort of directing each activity within the team yeah uh, that's a very good question and i did a whole phd on it <laughs> like the self-organizing nature of agile team <laughs> it's important because you know, when you say self-organizing, uh, what the impression is like, it's, it's leaderless. Like it's, it organizes itself, right? And uh, basically like in nature, we have so, much, so many self-organizing systems, right? So maybe like herds or a group of like birds or like ants. So in, in ecosystem, in the biology, we have these groups of people that are self-organizing, like birds that are I mean, migrating, all the things. But the human nature, when you put the team in a structure, which is the organization, it has the paradox of uh, self-organizing and then having managers like basically because in an organization you have you need to have a direct manager you need to report to them so basically the concept of self-organizing in the agile team were under discussion at the time that I did the research because the question was uh, we are leaderless but we have the manager. So what is it like? And uh, so to me, uh, um, self-organizing agile teams are not like self-organizing in a nutshell in what happens in nature because they are not leaderness. It's that the concept of the command and control is um, ideally being eliminated, but not like being leaderless because the still teams need to be leaders. So either they are official leaders like people managers, right? Or somebody who is uh, has the authority over team in terms of organizational structure, maybe product owner of the agile team or uh, what I observe in my research, somebody who is very good at their, their job, like their technical job, that they have this um, uh, this role of an official leader. So, uh, so basically, self organizing agile teams are the teams that are have the leader on the like the on the official level, but adopt the leader. The, according to the situation. So situational leadership or the shared leadership, like situation. So depending on the situation, the leaders might change or like it's shared, like it's shared between the two or three people who are more like, um, who are more uh, suitable for the situation, right? And these are the things that happen in agile teams. So, uh, yeah, so I can go deep into the concept. Yeah, well, I have a, I have a follow up question because yeah. you, yeah, I mean, your, 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 um, dissertation is, is really interesting reading. Um, Did you read it? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I didn't understand every word. That's why I'm so lucky. I get to ask you a question. So, um, you sort of, you, you went into some of the aspects of, uh, of a team they can be homogenous and they can have very similar skills yeah. or you can have like an A team where everybody has different skills. 
yeah. and that impacts how how they work with one another. And then you also got into social capital and human capital. Can you can you talk about the definition of social capital and human capital and how that affects how that team works? Yes. Yeah, so at the very beginning, when I talked about culture, I mentioned Nafia and Goshal 1998 uh, paper of uh, social capital that I really like. It's still valid for my works, like so in terms of culture and three dimensions. So to reminder of your audience, like we have a structural, cognitive and relational aspects of social capital. And I did, I put a, a lens on the concept of like social capital and the concept of teams and self-organizing teams in uh, agile teams. So what I did is like, I, I studied that how agile team uh, do in terms of urgent matters and what urgency is like, uh, I define urgency as something uh, sudden happen in terms of uh, uh, changing customer requirement needs or like changing car market needs or some kind of emergency that happens in terms of errors or logs or something like that. And then I felt I studied, I actually as a researcher, I studied four years about uh, uh, how the, the teams are forming in terms of the structure and cognitive and relations. And I find that uh, there are two generally two self-organizing agile teams. One are is uh, uh, the one, the ones that are homogeneous. And what are homogeneous is like in agile teams who are basically technical IT people. Uh, the development team is uh, homogeneous in terms of the level of their knowledge and in terms of diversity. Like this is less diverse team, and then they are like very good together they are more or less the same level in terms of knowledge and expertise and they are heterogeneous groups also that they are different different level of expertise or diverse group in terms of cultural background and all these things so basically these two major teams happen to be and then uh, when there is a hom uh, homogeneous, like they are, uh, look like each other and they are less diverse, I think that the concept of a situational leadership or shared leadership is more apparent because in terms of urgent needs, they, are, they just change according to the situation. And then the changing nature of the leadership is so more dynamic than heterogeneous uh, teams. Uh, in the heterogeneous is like uh, because it's actually more of a human uh, customer needs or more of a change and urgent need in terms of technical aspects people tend to choose the people who are more have more expertise in terms of technical level so and then the leaders the, the people go around leaders maybe one is always a leader like the emergent leader let's say the one who shows up all the time, everybody trusts them because the person actually can solve the complex issue in terms of the technical aspects. Uh, or uh, the more complicated perspective is like there are more leaders and then in terms of like, uh, yeah, there will be a competitive, you know, uh, uh, relationship between them so people goes ar go around and they form an island in one team so around technical people and it shows that uh, how the complexity of the problem a technical problem can affect the self-organizing nature of agile teams uh, when they are either diverse or non-diverse, homogeneous or uh, non-homogeneous, heterogeneous, let's say. So these are the things. So I actually, uh, it resulted to see that we cannot tell, we cannot tell that they are all the same um, nature in terms of self-organizing nature. We should define that. What are the complexity of their task? What are the technical tasks? And then what is the composition of the agile team? So we can tell uh, what will have, we can actually predict what will happen in the urgent matters in terms of uh, leadership and leadership formation. 
So think, think, thinking about an agile team, do you, is it your experience or is there a pattern that a team that's working well becomes more or less homogenous over time? Because I can see it going either way, right? People might yeah. cross train or they might be like, I've got this, just that's my specialty, leave me to it. Yeah, it depends actually the, of the culture of the organization itself, right? So, uh, and actually in the organizations, I see that some of the tasks are very complex, like very technically complex that you need to have experts, like very, you know, uh, seasoned experts in the team to help them go through the difficulties, right? And sometimes uh, when uh, an organization learns the more to put people in this uh, situation so they can resolve the problem. Because according to what I observed during my experiences, solving the problem is more important than team building in agile teams somehow. So, you know, replying to the customer requirement is more important than having a friendly team or uh, working on a team culture in the very nature. And then uh, I, I, I observe like very troublesome uh, experts that were actually a disaster into their teams, like they come completely ruin the team culture because they try to be the leaders and make the ice island. Uh, but they could actually, the, like people manager knew, knew about it, the manager of people manager knew about it, but they couldn't do anything about it because the person was so expert and then uh, in consequence so powerful that they couldn't do anything. Like if they, if they just... Um, you know, uh, just eliminate or like change this knot, the whole system will bro break. Mm. And to me, I think that uh, it's a very complex situation. <laughs> I think that it's one of the situation that we should just, you know, case by case use the human center approaches to see that what, how we can improve the experiences of the, uh, actually the team itself uh, one step at a time. We cannot do the radical changes, but one step at a time to see that how we can improve the team culture. But yeah, this is like um, doing the task. Uh, yeah, above all. <laughs> well, that's that's a, a, a fascinating illustration of human experience, right? You yeah. you might be an effective, you might be outputting code effectively, but the the team itself is eroding. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And this is happening. Like this is actually, this is the nature of uh, uh, many technical uh, teams, right? So you should do the task and then some people are toxic, but they're powerful. So. <laughs> so you, you raised the idea that there can be somebody who uh, has a very important role to play and they leverage that to say, now I'm the leader right? Um, and even in a team that's supposed to be self-organizing. Yeah. So you can see that there, there are instances where people want to lead. And then you can also imagine people coming from a more conventional hierarchical organization. Maybe they've been the only coder, they're very good at coding, and now they've been put in an agile team. And they might even be, I mean, it's probably rare that a new agile team member would be asked to lead it. But how do, what is an effective way for people to sort of exert leadership, even if they're not in charge within a self-organizing team? Uh, that's a good question, team. Uh, you know, I, you know, I talk about homogenous in terms of both homogenous in terms of uh, cultural diversity, like less diverse, and then in terms of the technical diversity. So, and then one paradox that is here, it was, it's not uh, actually inside my research, but it was one of the, uh, you know, consequence researcher and the re quest research question that needs to get addressed actually. And I, I'm curious if any other researcher answered that. Um, this is like, let's have a diverse team 
but uh, in terms of uh, uh, cultural background, and then some other, some like heterogeneous people. So, and then in terms of like being a diversity in cultures or background, actually it's also valid in design team. Then they can bring actually a beauty into the process because diversity can help uh, also leverage the creativity or creative problem solving in terms of not cultural, in terms of let's say that different countries, but you know, different like in terms of demographic, in terms of ages, in terms of like uh, sexual background, everything, right? So if there is a team like that, I think that then by human center approach and uh, enhancing the human experience, you can leverage these differences to make a harmony and then somebody might be a leader during like uh, technical, exp like, uh, you know, urgencies, but others might be leaders during like different situations, right? Because they have different perspective to the world. And then the beauty again is like, now we are not talking about team member experiences. We again talking about human experiences. So now we are, we are moving from a developer experience to human experience and then they can bring the harmony different perspective different norms different values to the team right but it's a very delicate job that leaders should consider like yeah, okay i have a very heterogeneous team in terms of the knowledge and expertise and in terms of the cultural background how to enhance how to use it not as a conflict but as a like harmonizer between people and it, i tell you it's possible right so uh, uh, but if uh, if there is some type of as as i said some kind of toxic people that people just are you know toxic around them it's hard to say but uh, at some point the leader should decide right because you might solve a problem one time second time third time with this help of these people but you should help uh, these people change their behaviors or do something about that because in the long run the toxicity is contagious and you shouldn't you know it shouldn't uh, you know uh, just you know spread across the whole organizational culture, right? Sometimes these experts, it's not like 100% toxic, I don't say that. But like these experts are really good at leading the team. Maybe they're always the leader, but they don't, they are taking care of the team at itself. So the second scenario is like two experts com uh, competing against each other. So basically you can, change the structural point like you can just take one person take this node of the network and take it to another team and change the situation so that's the actually the leveraging the social capital three dimension to change the team composition and team culture and enhance the experiences does that make sense we are getting yeah. so theoretical <laughs> well yeah i mean it is a I'm almost asking you for the solution to all management problems that ever existed when I asked that question. <laughs> so I'm glad you chipped away at it. Um, and of course, as you say, I, I forget who said it originally. I think it might have been it might have been Jack Dorsey from Twitter, but he said, "Beware the brilliant jerk." Right? Yes. You just don't want that person on your team. Do you know who said that? I forget. I, no, I think it might have been the expression. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the other challenges within agile teams. And, and I, I've been on small A agile teams, or at least we, we, we characterized ourselves as small mm -hmm. A agile, um, but I've never been uh, in a really rigorous agile team. So my understanding is from what I've read and, you know, there's the scrum and there's the Kanban, you know, the basically idea that you have all, you have a list of things that have to be done, the things that are in progress, the things that yeah. are done. And the project, the product manager can just keep adding things to the front end of the board. And then they make their way. To, it's almost like putting it into a machine. Yeah. And I think that that's good and bad because you can wind up with a team that's very efficient, 
but not very imaginative or creative. Um, but also maybe the product manager is like, I don't want creativity is my job. <laughs> Leave it to me. I'll put the things on the board and you just do them. So there's a tension there. Where should creativity lie? Should it be within the agile team? That's that's what that was actually one of uh, my research question back in 2011 during the four years of study. So one was self-organizing. Another one was do agile actually uh, trigger or leverage creativity so because at the time like when I did the research and uh, ended on 2015 there were still some advocates to see the say that a scrum basically the scrum type of agile is not designed to just you know enhance creativity it's just you know, agile means respond fast, right? Respond fast to the customer requirement and then the changing environment, basically. So when you're agile, you're just changing. You're more resilient to change without like, uh, so you have more elasticity <laughs> during change. However, uh, and then uh, when, at the time when I talked to agile uh, software developers, agile team members, they say that they don't have time because it's so agile, it's so fast. They don't have time to be creative, right? And it's like, uh, uh, you should do the task, you should deliver because the life, life cycle of each cycle is like 10 days at most. And then at the end of the day, you should deliver at the end of each cycle or what we call a sprint, right? And, uh, but what I observed here, and I think it, to date, it's also valid that there are some type of creativity happen in terms of creative problem solving. It's not in terms of you have suddenly have an innovative idea or something like that, but like, when you're under pressure or emergency, then uh, people need to be creative to solve the problem. Then it comes from the, again, emergent leader or the proposal around like solving a problem. <coughs> Sorry. The proposal around solving a problem in a creative way. So we have either the concept of creativity like making somewhere out of like uh, nowhere. So it's totally creative and then, or it's a creative idea. So maybe there is no time to make to action in agile team, but in terms of creative problem solving, yes, I can see the trace of creative problem solving that happens in agile team because of the pressure actually, because of the urgency that happens. And I think to the point is still uh, valid in terms of uh, creativity and innovation. The second point in terms of creativity that I, I observed that some leaders specify some slack time to their people. So uh, to learn and to just, you know, test and learn their ideas. So maybe like a Slack Monday or a Slack Friday, something like that. Um, when people like the leader really cares or the department like really cares about creative ideas. So you should specify some time for people to slow down and go to the creative mood so they can be creative. Uh, so there is a paradox of creative problem solving and creative ideas to action in agile things. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I can see that. It's not just what you're, it's not just the output, it's how you create the output. Yes. You can be creative about. Thank you for exactly. pointing that out. So we're getting close to the end. I have, I have my favorite questions at the end, but I have, I have two, two more in between, but they're also, uh, I had to ask when I saw this, you did a clubhouse, which is that sort of uh, live podcasting platform. Yes. Um, you, did, you did a panel on the topic of biomimicry in design thinking which I think is such, an, it's such a provocative theme. How can biomimicry be introduced into design thinking or is it the other way around? Okay, so uh, the clubhouse that we have is uh, under design thinking club and each day, uh, each actually week is somebody is leading that 
So I was not the leader for that panel. Like I am, uh, let's uh, uh, just uh, mention my friend uh, Vijay Chandler. So he was the one who brought this really creative, <laughs> really like <laughs> uh, concept onto the table. And basically, it's like how to. So in a nutshell, like very simple way, it's like how to mimic the nature to solve the human problems, right? So uh, something like that. And then how design actually or human center approach can help that. So basically to me for now, maybe I should educate myself more, but to me for now, it's like how to, uh, basically how to use, how to mimic nature to, uh, help people solve their problem, solve human issues, you can use human center approach, right? To, you know, mimic the nature. Uh, but on the other way around, like using the biomimicry for design thinking, I still need to educate myself. But this round, yes. So actually, like gathering data from nature and then test it through empathizing, defining and prototyping um, is actually a feasible uh, concept. And actually it's a really new and fascinating concept. It's new to me, but I, I need to know more about it, but yeah, um, it's a great topic. <laughs> well, for sure. And that's one of the interesting things about clubhouse is there's no recording. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah, it's it's gone. I, I I try to when I'm not a leader, I try to just take notes real fast. So uh, I say that again. I'm taking notes, but yeah, it's gone. <laughs> okay. So this is um, the next the next question is about something that you actually did lead. I understand, and this is also a very provocative topic. It's change management, uh, connecting it to design thinking. Yeah. So so. Um, can you can you expand on that? How does how do those two things work together? Yeah, so actually, this is my main job: connecting uh, design and change management. And it's just you know, being more than a year that I am officially advocating human-centered design for change management because it's about ten years that uh, I am using design for change management. And I tell you from the beginning that I was really frustrated to see that these models that uh, simply put, you know, human in a project aspect and then, uh, you know, treat human as project and check the boxes. So from the beginning, I was really like frustrated and struggling in the workplace about these aspects, right? And then I became familiar with the concept of the human center approach. So human center approach, I always stay in my advocation like, I'm not trying to change the model that you're practicing change management because we have thousands of model and obviously um, a hybrid or like one or two model is working for one change practitioner. And then we are fed up that uh, may be resistant to changing our <laughs> change model. So I'm not trying to just change, but I am adding one level a value to your perspective or not even adding that, but shed light on the, your right side brain to see that you can see the world through not the logical or sequential or check the boxes or factual level, which is all right, right level or project management level of change management, but really human center, like creative, like sensitive, emotional, an adventurous uh, way of uh, thinking about the human aspects in change management. So it's not one level, but it's adding, let's say, a piece that is actually missing in our practice in terms of bringing people-centered approaches into our whatever change model that we're using. So uh, because eventually in change management, we are talking about people side of the change and I am always like frustrated about using change as a project. Like change is a project that has opening and end and people are like need to 
to just uh, go through the change through this phase of the project. It's not actually the real life case, right? So that's why we want to uh, empathize with people, define the problem. Sometimes we even don't know what the problem is. So define the problem, uh, ideate the problem, and then prototype and test it uh, in the very iterative way so we can be more effective and create more sustainable changes. I think that's I think that's so valuable. I mean, it, it really does put a bow on the idea of human experience. That 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 we have a change in mind. It's going to affect a lot of people. Maybe we should check in with them while we're doing it, or even yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so my final question, and this has been a terrific conversation. I'm I'm so grateful that you joined me. The last question I think is 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 sort of my favorite because you have investigated and, and I, I think even advised on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, and you know, it is almost the opposite of human experience. We are, we are taking things that used to be done by humans and giving it to a machine, which has sort of been the, the march of human progress, but it, it's affecting almost every walk of life now. How do you take a human experience viewpoint and, and still take advantage of, of the capabilities of artificial intelligence? You know, what I see here in this scenario, and then we have a lots of talk also, a lot of talk on Clubhouse about whether AI can substitute human and change management and something that is has the people ingredient in it. So uh, my impression and what I learned from my peers and experts in our discussion is like, Basically, we should see AI as a tool that is uh, helping us do the job, not the, the one, you know, a tool that's doing the job for us, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I'm, there, there is like a philosophical concept that eventually machines can substitute us or not. Uh, I don't go into the details and what I think it, it might look like, but in terms of like a change management or human, like the branch of management consulting that are dealing with human side of everything, human side of business and humanization, I think AI can be so useful to, you know, help us analyze data, gather data, analyze data, give us the pattern and all these things, right? And also uh, it can help us, you know, have also more, more data that the human itself can analyze, right? So, and they can learn from the mistakes. So the AI can tell us like, what are the, uh, what are the things that keeps happening or like what are the other data or all the things can teach us, but actually, um, this is actually one source of data and nothing else because usually traditionally we use uh, historical data which is like uh, also uh, the result of like 360 surveys or like let's say everything surveys so uh, any company or any entity have this kind of historical data what uh, ai does for us is like give more pre more precise data analysis or for example, in terms of change management, we have this concept of organizational network analysis, like who is um, back to concept of social capital, what is, how is the structure of our network, who is influential, what is the relation between them. So it's a really huge work that if AI can manage to do for us, it can save lives, right? So actually AI can be a really effective tool to enhance human experience, but it's just one source of data. And then in a human center approach, we, when we test, we test according to different sources of data. If we rely on only one source, it has definitely biases, no matter it's human, or it's a machine or AI or something else. You have machine analysis, then you should, you should check it with uh, actual people and other sources of data like manual data to see that whether it, it has or not. 
and then decide on it, relying on one source of data, which is AI, and then just having this reason that it's a hype or it's just AI, <laughs> it cannot solve the problem. It adds complexity because AI has, has biases, right? So mm -hmm. uh, this is my impression here. I, I really uh, find that affirmative, this idea that, um, no, the, the machines won't replace us. They, they, they help us. And then we can yeah. wrap a human experience around that. I think that's terrific. That's, uh, yeah, let's hope for that. <laughs> Inez, thank you so much for being on the show. This was, this was great. That's great. Thank you, Tim, for having me. And thank you for your audience to listen, to be listening to me. Thank you all. It's my pleasure. My guest today was Bethnaz Galami. Bethnaz's LinkedIn profile and a link to her consulting firm, Deason, will be on the, in the show notes. My name is Tim Hampton, and you can reach me at tim at unusuallywellinformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation. 